Hello, everyone. This is uh, Glenn Woodworth from the Society uh, in Education and Anesthesia, and this is another one of our webcast series on innovations in education. And it's my great pleasure today to have Dr. John Mitchell, who is the current Vice Chair of Academic Affairs at Henry Ford Health. And the title of our topic today is a very interesting one, which is starting an education research group or an education research lab. So, John, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. This is a great topic, and I'm anxious to hear your thoughts about this. Well, thanks for having me, Glenn. I'm really excited about the topic. It's something that I've been passionate about for the last uh, number of years, and I'm happy to share what I know and uh, also some of what's out there in the literature on this. Awesome. So, I guess the first thing that we should talk about is you know, why do you think it's important for a department to form an education lab or an education research group? You know, since you invited me to do this, I've been musing on this again more. And since I uh, recently have uh, migrated to Henry Ford Health, um, part of what I'm going to be doing there is growing out the education lab concepts. That question has come up a, a number of times for me recently. To me, it's about uh, training and developing the next generation of educational uh, researchers and leaders, and also uh, answering some of the really important questions about how we educate people best. I feel like education has been done in many respects in the same way for a very long time, and now COVID's been a, an opportunity for us to disrupt and take a hard look at how we do things. Um, but you can't really um, get at some of the really core questions without good systematic uh, deliberate research on a large scale. And to do that, you need infrastructure and organization. And that's part of what an education research lab provides. So I heard you say two things. One is essentially faculty development so that you can continue to have a pipeline of new education, um, medical education researchers coming along. And then the second thing is to just, or sort of create the infrastructure that will actually allow you to do this type of research. Is that a reasonable summary of, I think, what you said there? That's correct. And then a, a third um, function, which is something that's also uh, addressed in other parts uh, of, of most uh, health systems, but not all, uh, is a concept of uh, allowing for some state-of-the-art education to occur, occur within a department or within an institution. And sometimes an education lab can fulfill that um, function as well. Although in the article you shared uh, with me from academic medicine, they, they point out that those are not necessarily uh, co-requirements for education and education research to coexist. But for me, it seems like if you're going to be doing research on people, you should be delivering a lot of high value state of the art education as part of that research. So in the models I've worked in and um, and on, uh, it makes perfect sense to me to also be uh, the uh, purveyor of a lot of that uh, state of the art um, education. So I think there's been a larger emphasis in the last few years. Um, you know, at least the last 10, 15 years on improving the quality of education research and really what can get published. And I think that places a greater demand on the education researchers to do a better job in terms of, of their methodology. And I think qualitative research sometimes can be a little bit more uh, challenging to do just because the, the methods are, are more unfamiliar to people that want to do it. I find tons of faculty want to do an education research project, but their familiarity with the methodologies and techniques, um, uh, you know, sometimes they're just not, not as familiar. Yeah, I mean, there are a number of challenges with educational or education research, uh, whichever you prefer to call it. Um, first and foremost is that the methodologies are fairly distinct in many cases from conventional bench or translational research. Um, the second of which is that funding is often hard to come by. Um, I think they use the word sporadic in one of the articles, and I, I quite agree with that. It's um, it's not so much feast or famine in education research, it's famine or starvation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to agree. <laughs> but certainly we could talk about, you know, funding strategies as well. But so having um, a, uh, a hub or a nidus uh, to education researchers to link in with, I think is, is therefore critically important. It serves a, a life raft function, a motivational function, and a development function. Um, but it's also like a lighthouse or a beacon to other programs that you are 
your institution is invested in educational research and uh, therefore is, is some place to collaborate with. And if you each have some resources and some infrastructure and can share that and share the workload, um, then, um, you know, there's that old expression, many hands make light work. Yeah. So you can actually get a fair bit of education research done um, if you spread out uh, the uh, the work across a number of centers who have uh, these kinds of, this kind of infrastructure. Well, that, that brings a great segue, I think, into the next point is maybe we should talk a little bit about what would be the basic structure of an education research group or lab at a, any institution. So sort of give us a framework of what you think um, would need to be constructed to try and do this. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I thought, you know, I've always thought of it as uh, as one of uh, two basic models, which is uh, a model where there's a single PI um, and there's a model where there are multiple PIs collaborating together. Um, the academic medicine article that's going to be attached here also talks about, um, you know, research networks and collaborations, although I would argue that those have to be an outgrowth from a from a lab. Um, for the most part, um, and I also would argue that um, for most models uh, and for most startups, the best approach or the most practical approach, I should say, there's no best or worst, but the most pragmatic approach would be starting with maybe a single investigator that really has a strong foundation, but charging that person with growing other investigators. So in my time at Beth Israel Deaconess, um, you know, I started up um, certain the Center for Education Research Technology and Innovation, uh, and a big part of my mission was training the next generation of educational researchers so that uh, having left certain, I know it's in great hands and that the, there are a group of people that I helped to train and, and uh, teach how to do the job well. And I'm, I'm applying the same formula at Henry Ford, um, which is to say bringing in a group of extremely motivated um, uh, and bright uh, educational researchers, but teaching them some of the lessons I've learned over the last almost 18 years of doing this uh, and helping them avoid some of the pitfalls and accelerating that trajectory for them so that over time they will grow into, uh, will grow into a multi-PI research center. Um, well, I, I guess I wish, uh, hearing you chat about it, I wish I would have been a member of, you know, a, a, one of your mentees in your group having had to come up through the ranks and learn it by the seat of the pants. Um, I think that the the mentoring role is, is critical. Um, so let's, again, I, I try to make this practical, you know, these, these webcasts very practical. So let's say you are an education researcher and you've been doing some good work. I, I, I put myself in that category. I wouldn't say I'm doing great work, but if I would say I was doing some good work, um, ha I'm not a lab, you know, or I'm not, I'm not this thing that you've described other than you're saying that all uh, the main factors that I would be, need to recruit faculty within my department to then become education researcher. Can you, can you elaborate that on a little bit? What would be the process upon which I would go do this recruiting and what kinds of resources would I need to do for faculty development for those individuals? Some interest. Yeah, I think step one is, you know, you've already achieved the first couple of steps, which are to demonstrate that you have, you know, uh, the ability to conduct high level education research uh, that's going to um, uh, answer important questions and uh, be well received by journals. And the second step is branding. Uh, and it sounds uh, perhaps a little self-serving, but I, I think I was pleased to see that was buttressed in the article that that you sent along to me too. That if you have a brand um, and uh, you identify as a lab, um, then uh, it it helps to uh, enhance funds flow either through philanthropic sources or grant applications and other things. Um, so really, even if you just stuck a shingle out on the door that said that Glenn Woodworth. Institute for Educational Research. Um, so this is a little the field of dreams. It, you know, if I build it, they will come. Absolutely. I mean, I think those are the two basic steps. And then, as you mentioned already, the third step is to find kindred spirits that want to work with you and uh, 
And the, uh, an important element of that is everybody checks their egos at the door, rolls up their sleeves and agrees to help each other out. Um, so one of the things I like about um, research labs or institutes is that um, you can come together with, even if you have, uh, don't have infinite resources and prioritize projects across, um, across investigators and figure out what your institute's primary goals are. So I think that's sort of the, the next step. And once you have those things, you go ahead and present a use case to funding sources. Um, and that's, uh, that's sometimes difficult, but easier once you have a clear mission and vision, aims and goals. Um, and I've been through that process a few times now. Um, it's important to figure out, um, even if you're starting as a single PI lab, yeah, I think it's short-sighted to only prioritize one investigator's uh, research interests. So uh, you spend, a, I spent a lot of time uh, as I've moved over to Henry Ford talking to the group there and figuring out what everybody's interests are. So I may be the, I may be the, um, the catalyst, but I want to make sure that everybody's ideas are represented uh, and supported through, uh, through any um, process that we have going on. So we're going to come back to funding because I think that's not just funding for education research, but essentially funding for a lab, I think might be a slightly different question. But let's go back to the recruitment of faculty. It's probably pretty common in any department that you've got 50, 60 faculty, and there's lots of them that are interested in education. And then there's a smaller subset that, oh, I want to do this project. I want to work on diversity. I want to work on this. I want to work on that. Um, how do you bring them under this umbrella of um, the the lab when it's like most of them will be unfunded and in fact, probably all of them will be unfunded and also from the department's eyes, you know, they're relatively unfunded in this dearth of academic time now for for people. So how do you how are you going to you know bring those faculty into the fold? Yeah, I mean. Uh, I've always uh, recruited, you know, Randy Shaw has a saying, uh, recruit for um, uh, talent and uh, and then uh, train for excellence. Uh, I think I'm paraphrasing there. Sorry, Randy, if I butchered your, your <laughs> statement, but uh, essentially I try to find the, you know, the most motivated people that are most passionate about their projects and figure out how to support that. Um, you know, if people are motivated and they're willing to um, adapt, um, you know, they're not, uh, they're, they're willing to take on suggestions and bounce back from tough reviews and things like that and carve out those windows of time where they can um, work on projects, no matter what obstacles uh, they're faced with personally or professionally. That's what I'm really looking for for a collaborator in my institution or outside of my institution. Somebody that's really just got the love for it and is willing to 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 contribute to other projects and also has ideas for their own own projects. That's that's extremely helpful. Uh, if they have one or the other, that's great. But if they have both, then that's that's a great recipe for building a team. Um, so you know, obviously. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, you, you mentioned that people you typically don't come with funding and that's that's fine. I mean, um, you've got to try to identify what your internal and external funding sources are. And a lot of times initial funding is going to have to come from um, from the department level um, before you're able to level up. Uh, sometimes institutionally, there are grants that you can apply for. Uh, and that's been extremely helpful for me in the past. and. Uh, you know, I've got to do some homework and see what's what's available uh, through my health system now. But then there are also national level grants, obviously, that you can apply for, depending on what the focus of your uh, institute is or your or your um, uh, research uh, passions are going to be as a team. Um, and then from there, uh, yeah, making a five year plan towards towards funding and putting together uh, and you you've come from a business background so you could probably do this much better than I can sort of a business proposal um, it's typically a, you know a proposal where you balance the financial input of a department against the academic development of its men, uh, of its members and then also demonstrate uh, what the long-term viability prospects are in terms of 
you know, by year X, I propose that we're going to, you know, support um, some of our endeavors with funding, uh, but we're also going to have achieved, you know, promotions for these people and national presentations or publications, whatever metrics you can define with your department that are valuable. And different departments may have different priorities, right? A chair may really need, uh, or a department may really need a vehicle for promotion. Uh, a department may want more national visibility. A department may want a better relationship with their medical school in terms of enhanced teaching programs um, or potentially some mix of all of the above. So it sounds like a discussion with your chair as you're setting up your lab to try and make sure that you understand your chairs and therefore your department's priorities um, to make sure that you're in alignment with those. I think that's a good suggestion. Now, many of the things that you've suggested is, is we've talked about, you know, trying to mentor this next group of faculty um, coming up. And that's part of your sustainability, right? Is having a, a steady pipeline of, of researchers that are, are developing this field, even if they go someplace else, but at least to keep some going. Um, at your own institution, what I'm what I sounds like is that you probably need to formalize some of the things that we sort of naturally are doing with our junior colleagues. You know, reviewing their papers and making some comments about their methodology before they start an experiment, and pointing them towards funding. And you know, but I, I would say, um, can you can you tick off what you think are the most important things that you need to formalize in this lab that you know, you have a direct, um, it, it's part of your mission that you want to do these X, Y, Z things in terms of mentorship. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the first thing is uh, having a conversation with somebody about what their goals are from, from doing education research, because people, people may have different goals. Some people may see this strictly as a vehicle for career advancement. Other people may see it independent of career advancement as a way to answer questions they're curious about. And most people have some variety or some, some mix of those priorities. Um, and so understanding what somebody's looking for. I've had conversations with mentees where they're like, I don't care if I ever get promoted, but I'm really passionate about this specific question because I've seen it come up over and over and I want to figure out the best way to do it. Um, and that's helpful to understand about somebody because they may, want to invest in more long term projects that um, that don't necessarily result in as many um, abstracts or publications in the short term, but get get at that core question more so than collaborating uh, on a number of other ongoing projects that may yield fruit a little earlier for them and help them along that academic trajectory, even as they're working on that long term piece. Um, and that'll help because not, people don't have unlimited bandwidth to, to put into things. And so understanding how much time and energy somebody wants to invest and where, where it's most wisely invested. And then um, priorities from there, you outlined a number of the really important things, which is uh, teaching somebody how to formulate a question well, uh, organizing up a, a proposal and an IRB, and then um, making sure they understand uh, the methodology of a study specifically, um, the statistics. Heaven knows I'm not a statistical genius by any stretch, <laughs> but I really respect the statistical geniuses I know and I'm smart enough to know that I need to do a power analysis up front to make sure a study is not doomed and need to make sure that I have enough um, collaborators uh, in a pipeline that we can we can get enough subjects to, and have a, a good methodology to answer a question. Um, and so those are sort of the upfront things. Uh, and then from there, um, often it's a part apprenticeship and part structured didactic. Uh, you know, you may choose within your center to, to offer structured didactics. You may choose to encourage people to pursue additional degrees or have additional non-degree bearing educational programs they can pursue. And there are a number of those out there depending on your institution. And then also through the Society for Education Anesthesia, we have a number of excellent pathways um, for people to build these skill sets, including some of the new uh, education research mentoring pathways that Ted Sakai and others have worked really hard on. Um, and also some of the other mentoring programs uh, within the organization. So um, we need to... We need to set up our lab. We need to brand it. Um, we need to uh, try and figure out what our mission is and how that aligns with our chair's priorities. We need to set out probably explicitly what our mentoring goals are 
as we tend we try to recruit uh, faculty into our lab. Um, I think you mentioned a few infrastructure type things. So we can facilitate research by our colleagues, by these people that are coming into our lab, by giving them, at least pointing them in the right direction to resources that we know how to get there. It could be funding, it could be a, a statistician who does this type of work. Um, you know, not every statistician does every type of work, right? So being able to point them to the right one for the right type of qualitative research that they're gonna be doing. I think all of those things would be part of the infrastructure. And then I heard also, you know, having some sort of metrics, right? So whatever, what are, how are we going to measure our outcomes? And whether that's in terms of abstracts or publications or advancement, but that would be a good thing to think about in setting up the lab is, um, you know, what our ultimate outcomes would be. Yes, and if I may, I don't know if I have uh, screen sharing ability here, but the, I would like to, if I can, see if I can share a slide here. Just hit the share button down at the bottom. So, for example, like, uh, I don't know, oh, that's not the one I want. Uh, what am I sharing with you, my email? Uh, yeah, your screen. I think your whole screen. Oh, really? Okay, then let me pull this down. Uh, no problems, just solutions. Perfect, got it. Okay, boom, look at that, thanks. It shared the wrong thing, but we fixed it. And that's part of the resilience component of uh, education <laughs> research. Um, so I always have a, I develop a pitch deck uh, for these sorts of things that I always have on tap because uh, you never know when a potential donor is going to knock on your door. You never know when you're going to have to explain things. So I think it's always important to have your, you know, a mission statement and aims and core values uh, sort of. Uh, sort of listed out and articulated well so that everybody understands sort of where you're going. And so this slide's a little busy. I'm probably going to split it up into multiple slides, but um, it differs from when I was uh, at certain. I have different problems that I've talked to people about that they're passionate about, but it, it, it boils down to sub areas. And then within those areas, people may gravitate towards different things. So, for example, skill knowledge and workflow retention, metric development and application, increasing educational efficiency and then also as we mentioned educational leadership training are going to be the core uh, issues that we tackle uh, in this uh, learning and leadership dichotomy um, or synergistic relationship uh, for Harold um, kind of like having a uh, I, I kind of like having some formal didactic series at least in terms of the education on on qualitative research methods I think that would be I think that would be valuable I like that idea yeah, the um, I'll stop uh, sharing here if I can find the, the thing, but yeah, it's always, uh, I guess that's another pro tip. Always have your um, slide deck candy. Uh, let's see, where's the down at the bottom and there'll be a share button for you to knock off the sharing. Well, okay, so I want to move to another aspect of this, which is, do you think it's uh, beneficial? I think it down at the very bottom of the screen, there will be the share button. Do you think it's beneficial to do this as a within the Department of Anesthesia, within the institution, you know, setting up a lab that's institution, or do you think uh, you would you, you or would is this you know set up a lab multi institution? I know those are different, very different things, but how do you propose a department that wants to get started? What do you think is the best way to get started? Yeah, I think it depends on your relationships within your institution and um, and your focus as an as an uh, educational endeavor. I'm a, my slogan typically is make the pie bigger. So, like, if you can find people that are, have passions about this across uh, departmental lines or across national lines, you figure out a way to be inclusive and and help each other out. So, coming into a new environment uh, like uh, coming into Henry Ford, I've been working closely with a number of outstanding people within the department, and then also trying to build some bridges across departmental lines. Because I think, um, like I said, nobody uh, is gonna have the resources to do everything on their own. So you've gotta build relationships and uh, grow learner bases to answer questions. And so by sharing resources and sharing ideas, I think that's always the best way to go, um, you know, it helps if if a certain department's ready to uh, anchor the endeavor or departments uh, just to get it started. But um, you know, even at Beth Israel Deaconess, I, I started in the Department of Anesthesia, and that's where it certain was primarily 
uh, going, but by the by the end of my time there, I was also working at the in the Rabkin Fellowship for Medical Education across divisional lines and across hospital lines to mentor people. Um, and uh, so I think that's it's incredibly uh, valuable to be able to do that. Um, but I think, I think the more common path is to uh, to start within your own in your department and then gradually grow it out. Or is it more common? Do you think that? People start these as, you know, oh, let's get together. We know there's a strong education research group and in or a, a education researchers in in emergency medicine and let's partner with them and we're gonna form a lab. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think the typical model from my reading and also from my experiences is that it starts in one department and spreads out. I mean, there are models like the Shapiro Center for Education uh, at BIDMC where it's cross departmental um, from the beginning. Um, but the usual uh, model is is a, a strong department grows out an educational research core and then starts collaborating across departmental lines and being inclusive. And I think um, that tends to that model tends to repeat itself over and over from what I've what I've seen. Uh, it's a little I think a little more challenging to develop something at the hospital level or an institute or network level from the start. Um, without a strong base, um, but there may be That's exceptions. Good That's a good point. That. Well, uh, let's close with what I think is the most difficult part of this, which would be sustainability. And um, I think you could do this lab if it was unfunded. I mean, I'm certainly generally don't have funding for most of the education research work that I do. Um, even when I can get funding, it's often very small grant, you know, local institutional grants, foundation grants, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, is it going to take a lot of money to start this lab and keep it sustainable? And is it going to have to have like somebody's basic science lab? Do we have to have reliable grant funding to be able to keep that thing going? What was your experience at Beth Israel? So at Beth Israel, it was many years before I formalized lab concepts. So we had pockets. That had grown out. We had an echo, an outstanding echo lab that I collaborated with that did uh, educate, that also did echo education research and focus research. Uh, later, uh, our chair uh, supported a, an uh, education lab that was a, a skills training center, essentially for our department that was dedicated. And so, in certain, I coalesced those resources uh, and then also brought some additional resources to the table. To sort of also deal with non technical skills training um, and uh, teaching and learning skills or pedagogy. Um, and uh, fortunately, the, the, uh, the teaching and learning and the, um, and the uh, non technical skills are typically less costly to pursue than the, than the technical skills. So adding those in later wasn't a, a big obstacle. Um, you know, the technical skills training. I think is uh, typically a little more um, costly to get off the ground, depending on how you approach it. My preference has always been for um, it, um, quantitative um, efforts at technical skills assessment. As you know, I do a lot of motion tracking and use a lot of uh, simulator based education. And so those can be um, expensive. However, if you develop um, uh, a track record and strong relationships um, within the uh, um, simulation community, and then also potentially have some negotiating uh, opportunities with the um, simulator companies. You can you can bring some of those costs under under control. Um, the uh, but uh, and then also the the larger your scale, the more likely you can lever up to larger scale. Uh, grants, uh, and so my, a big focus for me in my career now is is pursuing kind of larger scale grants. Uh, I've been fortunate at, at sort of the uh, middle level with some really great starter grants and some uh, some support from FAIR and the um, our departmental or our hospital insurance company and things like that. But I think the next step for sustainability is pursuing. Money from the federal government, either NIH or D and or DOD funding, uh, and that's a little more challenging to go after. But in terms of learning the ropes, but 
Uh, if you have friends that do that in the um, translational realm or the basic science realm, they can be a big help to help navigate those systems. Oh, I think you're muted, Glenn. Great. I think it's a good path that you might have some small funding within your department, but I think the next step up, I think FAIR is an excellent, um, an excellent stepping stone for uh, either for the principal PI or to try to get some of the mentees to get a FAIR grant would be a great way to sort of get them launched. And then, as you mentioned, you know, trying to level up at, at the sort of the pinnacle of the game to get um, DOD or, um, you know, NIH funding, I, I think those are certainly opportunities. I'd also say the Macy Foundation, you know, is, would be a possible avenue. And then also the, uh, the AMA has like reimagining residency, you know, there's some other um, grants that you can get from, um, from some of those organizations. But, yep, I think that definitely would be, um, has to be in that, that five-year plan that you discussed is try to find a path towards uh, sustainability and funding, and I think that's probably one of the most daunting uh, things for any uh, PI to, you know, if it's not in basic science that has readily access to funds to, you know, to think about. So, yeah, you. we talked about resilience as a characteristic of uh, educational researchers, and uh, if you're resilient and eager to learn, there are uh, plenty of pathways to learn more about those funding sources. And if you're willing to try and fail a few times, it's um, you can develop those skills. It's certainly not impossible for education researchers to learn how to write a, a competitive grants and find pockets of funding uh, that will be amenable uh, to their research passions. Um, it's uh, it's not an easy road, but it, if it's what you love, you you gotta you gotta go for it. Well, uh, this has been a fascinating discussion, uh, John. Thank you so much for joining us in this uh, webcast today. I thank um, all of the SEA faculty and um, you know members will find find this fascinating because, uh, and I'm sure there's you may have just been a little bit of a piece of sand that will maybe get a couple more education labs uh, started in our anesthesia community. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Just a shout out to others, some other folks with education labs, De uh, Deb Schwingle and the folks at Hopkins, uh, Susie Martinelli and Faye Chen at UNC, uh, the groups out at UCSF that are pursuing this and, um, and there are a number of other people across the country. So uh, credit where credit is due. They're all doing amazing work. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.